Ooh, wow, okay. Oh, this is like the first time in a couple days where I've actually made an effort in my physical appearance. <laughs> Hey, what's up you guys? My name is Steffi, AKA In My Humble Opinion, and welcome back to our last Fleabag video. <laughs> this is the Fleabag q and I'm so sorry that this video is like, I guess like, mm, like two, three-ish days late. There really is no excuse because I've just been at home pretty much all the time. I feel like the reason why I have procrastinated and done this last minute once again is because psychologically I keep thinking like if I just keep pushing it back that means that I still have more flea bag content to make so yeah I don't know it's like weird but um Yes, welcome to the Fleabag Q&A. I haven't really done a Q&A like this for any of the shows I've covered in like quite a long time. So I had to make an exception though because this is like genuinely one of my favorite shows I've ever covered on the channel and I wanna talk about it with as many people as possible. So yeah, let's just get into the questions. And of course, thank you to everyone who took the time to watch the videos and who sent in questions especially. So I'm gonna answer all of them, hopefully I, got all of them printed out here. And yeah, all right, here we go. The first question comes to us from Mike Pegg on YouTube. Mike says, a perfect way to end, um, okay, well, go to the question. Mike asks, was there any point after you watched the very first episode that you weren't convinced about the show and thought not worth continuing? I wasn't convinced, but the payoff was so worth it. Really enjoyed your reactions. Well, thank you, Mike. First episode, I was very open-minded. I gave it a chance. And then second episode happened and I was like, okay, I think it might've been a third episode where I was kind of like, not to say that those like three episodes were bad, but I just was kind of left like wondering kind of like where this was going. I'm pretty sure I even say it at 1.2. If you go back and watch like those first couple episodes from season one that I did, I'm pretty sure one of the questions that I asked, it might've been in the very first video in the first episode for season one. One of the questions I asked was like, if it wasn't for the hype, would you continue the show? And I think at that point I had said, I'm not quite sure. For me, I feel like the season started to turn around in the episode where Claire and Fleabag went to the silent retreat, but the payoff is definitely worth it. <laughs> Hence why we're still talking about the show. The next question comes to us from Amelia Craig. Amelia asks, oh, and Amelia, this was actually one of my favorite questions. So I thought this was a really, really interesting one. Quite a few British comedy series that we deem classic are deliberately ended after just two, usually six episode series slash seasons. As an American, can you see the benefits in doing this? Having a pre thought out arc and goal and sticking to it, no matter how potentially profitable it would be to bang up more and more to my mind is exactly how I want this intelligently thought through series to end. Yes, Amelia, I'm assuming based on your question, you might be European, you might be British, but I definitely feel like there is a benefit in <laughs> just keeping a series, not even necessarily like keeping a series short, but it's better to write a series knowing what the end goal is and not trying to manipulate the original series ending because the show suddenly becomes very, very popular and there's a chance to capitalize on that popularity. For me, like when I think back on the shows that I've enjoyed that are specifically made in America, like I'm thinking about like my first real TV obsession was Desperate Housewives. <laughs> says a lot about me. Their seasons typically lasted like 22 to 23, 24 episodes each. There were some seasons that I didn't even watch, honestly. But I remember watching an interview with the showrunner of that show. His name is Mark Cherry. He like legit said there were times when he was in the writer's room and he and the writers didn't know what they were doing. Like they didn't even know what the end goal of that particular season was going to be. So they would just be like making things up as they went. And I feel like as a viewer, you can really tell when that is happening. And it kind of diminishes the quality of the show over time. I feel that same exact way for um, another show I really, really like loved growing up to was Glee. I personally feel for any Gleeks out there who are watching this, I personally feel like they should have stopped at season three. And I think there were conversations around that time of like, oh, I think like they were originally supposed to end at season three, but because the show was just so popular, they kept like renewing it. And then by the time the series had actually 
end it. The ending was so like anticlimactic, despite the fact that Glee was one of the biggest shows at its heyday. But when it went off the air, it was just kind of like, meh, like it didn't really matter. And it was because like, by the time they got to the fourth, fifth, sixth season, the quality of the show had gotten so bad to the point where no one even cared. Even the most loyal of viewers to that show had a hard time trying to care because in a way, the show didn't even care. Like it kind of like disrespected the story. It disrespected the viewers, at least in the case with Fleabag. I love that each season is so freaking short. It's just six episodes each. And I like the fact that Phoebe, at least for the time being, like ended it at season two. I think I even remember reading or hearing in an uh, interview somewhere that the first episode of season two was actually supposed to be like episode three, but then upon further reflection, she decided like, no, whatever happened originally in the first two episodes of season two, it doesn't really matter. Like, let's just cut to the chase. And like, that's the sign of a good writer when she knows how to pace her story and where the meat of the story is so that she's not wasting any time. And I think that's especially important too in today's media consumption because there is just so many options out there. As a viewer, for me, I don't wanna waste time on a show where I feel like they're wasting my time. So with that being said, very long-winded answer, but Amelia, yeah, I definitely think there's a benefit into deliberate, intentional storytelling and not dragging things out for the sake of popularity and for the sake of capitalizing on that popularity. All right, so question number three comes from Gianluca Sousa. I really hope I did not butcher that. I'm so sorry. He asks, would you watch a clear spinoff of the show. Hmm. Ooh, that's tough. I kind of like in a way would be interested in watching a web series of Claire. Not necessarily like a full drawn out like 20 something minute episode following Claire, but I wouldn't mind if there was like a mini web series about Claire where it's like maybe five to seven minutes long each. Would Claire be breaking the fourth wall too? Like, I feel like that's something only Fleabag would do. Would we see Fleabag? Because then if we were to see that character at any point in this quote unquote Claire spinoff, me as a fan of Fleabag would be like, oh God, please talk to us. Like, I don't, I don't know. So for me, I'm gonna say I would watch a Claire spinoff if it was done as like a web series. That was like a weird answer, but I don't know, that's just how I feel. So the next question comes to us from Twitter. Cameron Gray Rose asked, why do you think Martin kissed Fleabag? He was in full view in the garden. Anyone in the house could have seen them. I think it was part of a long con to drive a wedge between Claire and Fleabag. Wow, that is a really great theory, Cameron. And you know what? I'm just gonna side with you and say that's probably why he did that. I'm also just gonna say too, and probably this is not the most thoughtful response, I just, feel like he's an ass. He's such an asshole. There's nothing likable about that character. And I, I feel like he just like did it because in his head, he's thinking like, why not? I could potentially get away with it. He kind of liked to take advantage of people and like to take advantage of the situation. And it wasn't until things got really, really bad where suddenly he's gonna try and be this quote unquote nice guy. So yeah, I just, I feel like your your theory is a lot more thoughtful and smart, so I'm gonna go with what you say, but um, Martin's, Martin's an ass. <laughs> Question number four comes to us from Mackenzie Teague. Again, I'm sorry if I butchered your last name. Mackenzie asks, is Claire's husband forgivable? No, for me, I don't think he's forgivable because in that finale episode, when he and Fleabag and Claire were in the kitchen and he's basically like pleading for Claire to not leave him. And he's saying, well, I do this and I do that. And I know I'm not the greatest guy, but I make you laugh. And that's what you wanted. You wanted someone who made you laugh and I make you laugh. I just feel like he, does the bare minimum like all the things he was bringing up that he does like i don't freaking know like he picks up jake from his bassoon lessons or something like i'm sorry that's what you're supposed to be doing <laughs> 
as a father and as a husband partner to Claire. Next question comes to us from Miss Koi Fish Pony Productions. Miss Koi asks, do you think our priest at any moment, whether after he and Fleabag kissed in church or when they had sex at Fleabag's place, ever blamed Fleabag for this affair and not take responsibility for his faults of weaknesses, etc. in this situation? Or was he responding in a fairly understandable way? And then Miss Koi follows up the first question with, I asked because one, I personally think the priest did blame Fleabag for the affair and not take responsibility for his own actions in the whole thing. Wow, that is a really, really great question. You know, in a way, I felt like the priest's initial reaction after the Neil scene in the church where when they're in the church and the picture falls he separates from her and he kind of like gives her this look and he like kind of shakes his head and walks away I in a way felt like the priest saw Fleabag as some sort of temptation that he gave into because there were a lot of religious themes in season two obviously and I guess in a way that kind of ties into this idea of like Adam and Eve Eve giving into temptation and I feel like women in general especially Especially religious texts, you're kind of seen as like the temptress. And I don't know if this was intentional on Phoebe's part as a writer, if that was like a nod to that, but I felt like in that way, the priest saw that Fleabag was this temptation that he gave into. She was like this quote unquote forbidden fruit that he took a bite of. So yeah, I guess I would say I, I would agree with you there then that he kind of blames Fleabag to a certain extent. Okay, so then the next question is, do you think the priest was ever truly and completely devoted to God? Or was it a situation where he was in love with the idea of being wholly devoted to God for the rest of his life and just didn't think about thoroughly what that kind of decision could mean? Then Miss Coy follows it up with her personal explanation and says, I personally liked the priest and Fleabag as friends rather than a couple. And I personally saw the priest as someone who was in love with with the romantic idea of being a priest and being wholly devoted to God for the rest of his life, but doesn't fully understand what that means and therefore was not prepared for the day when he would have to choose between falling in love with a woman or continuing loving God. Mm. Wow, that's a really great question as well. <laughs> um, huh. I think the priest genuinely believed in his devotion to God. Even though this isn't something that's explicitly stated in the narrative of the show, throughout the series, we kind of see him having a bit of a conspicuous relationship to alcohol. I'm not quite sure if he may have been an alcoholic and then he found God and that was the thing that was able to save him. That's just, for me, the impression that I get from that character. And I feel like in that sense, he needed something to believe in. And in that moment, that thing was God. And he believed wholeheartedly in his devotion to God because that was the thing that saved him. However, that's all fine and dandy until there is something that comes into the situation that will test your devotion to God in this context. I'm not quite sure if the priest ever thought about the potential possibility of meeting someone later down the line who may question his devotion to God. I just think in the moment he decided to turn to religion, he was just like, I'm all in. And that was pretty much it. He didn't have that much foresight into, well, what if this happens? And what if that happens? Then do I truly love God? Like he was just like really in the moment when it came to committing himself to God. So I guess in a way, it, I, I feel like it's a it's a mix of both for me. Like I genuinely do believe he was and is completely devoted to God, but then at the same time wasn't necessarily thinking about what that could mean and how that could play out for the rest of his life. Great question there. <laughs> Next question comes from Jacques Line. And actually his question or her question was a question that was asked by two other people as well. So Jacques Line, John Martin, and Yulia Stora Stora's Hylova. You you yeah, Yulia Stora's Hylova. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay. All three of you asked, what do you think about the foxes? What what do I think the fox symbolizes. Let's see, and Yulia um, has some theories here. Yulia says, it has its undeniable symbolism, and in my opinion, it could be one of those. One, romantic love itself. Two, his flaws. Three, his animal self slash the part of him that is allowed to love romantically. And four, 
God. Personally, I believe that it's his own self that is allowed to love romantically. He runs from though I'm really curious what are your thoughts on the matter. Yeah, I didn't realize that this was such a highly debated topic within the Fleabag fan community. In fact, I kind of cheated a little bit. I looked up fox symbolism and I read this really interesting article from Vulture that I'm sure a lot of you have read, but I'll put it in the description box. But in that article, they offer up like multiple theories as to what the fox could mean. I don't know if this is like too general, but I feel like the fox in a way represents the priest's humanity. When the priest first starts to explain his thing about the foxes, the way in which he reacts to foxes is, it's like paranoia. He's like kind of like, oh my god, are they watching me? And it's actually quite endearing and humorous. And I feel like we see the appearance of the fox in the moments when the priest is being vulnerable with another person. I think this was an episode two of season two. That moment when he really begins to start opening up to Fleabag and they're sitting on the bench. That's the first time we see the fox and that's the first time we hear about his little paranoia with the fox. And then at the very end, after Fleabag is completely vulnerable with him and tells him that she loves him and then he says to her that he loves her too, that's like the moment where we actually see the fox physically manifest. And you know, again, that was like a very human moment between the two characters, a very vulnerable emotional moment between the two characters. So I, in a way, feel like the fox represents the priest's humanity in some way. I don't know. I'm sorry if that's like a really like shitty answer. I feel like in a couple weeks when I start thinking about this like more and more and more, that answer will probably be better. But as of right now, that's what I think. John Martin also asked some additional questions here. John Martin says, I love your reaction to him noticing her break the fourth wall. I did the same. Literal scream when they were sitting in the cafe. But what do you think that means? I think the fact that the priest can tell when she breaks the fourth wall just goes to show how intense tuned he is to her, how much he listens to her, how much he pays attention to her, and how much he sees her. In that first episode, Fleabag, during the dinner scene, it has that line where she says, nobody has asked me a question in like 45 minutes. And then he asks her a question like right after she like makes that observation. So I feel like that line and that idea of him being able to notice when she breaks the fourth wall just goes to show he's someone who actually notices her and sees her for like who she is, flaws and all. He's not scared of that either. He in, I think, God, I forget what, which episode this happened, but oh yeah, it was in the episode when Andrew Scott literally turns and looks at the camera. That's kind of preceded by these moments where he starts to ask her a lot of questions and then Fleabag turns to us and is like, oh, he's kind of annoying. The reason why she was saying he's kind of annoying was because he was starting to get a little too, too close and too personal for her liking in a way that kind of made her actually feel a bit uncomfortable. So yeah, I, I feel like that's the reason why he breaks the fourth wall is because he really sees her for who she is. Question number three from John Martin is, how do you feel about no third season? I hated it at first, but now I'm okay with it because unless she ends up with the hot priest who's gay in real life, just a nice FYI for you, LOL, I don't know if I'd want it. I'm sure it'd be amazing, but still. I'm fine with no third season. I know in some interviews that I've watched now of Phoebe, uh, Phoebe, <laughs> whoa, of Phoebe Waller-Bridge, it's really funny because while I was watching the show, I did not watch any Phoebe Waller-Bridge interviews because I did not want to be spoiled. So now, like recently, I've been like watching a lot of Phoebe interviews. And I think she had said in an interview that maybe in 10, 20 years, I don't know if that's the number she gave, but like, let some time pass and then potentially maybe a season three, but not like right now. Yeah, I quite like the idea of, uh, of coming back to her when, well, me, when I'm 50. Right. Because I feel like she would have had, you know, more life then and God knows what she would have got up to. And actually <laughs> seeing like, a character like that in a later stage of life, I think is, is exciting. But I can't, I think for now, She's been through enough. <laughs> yeah, she has. We gotta let her go. Let her Let's have go. some rest. <laughs> yeah. Well exactly. deserved rest. Exactly. But honestly, like, if she were even to not do that and just let the story end here, I'd be fine with it because I think the way this show ended was so 
perfect and like I don't want to think about it too much or else I'm gonna cry. Yeah, all right. And now we have some questions from Addy. Three questions from Addy. Which character you like the most after Phoebe Waller-Bridge? Okay, so <laughs> you're assuming that the character I like the most is Fleabag. Gosh, I would say it's a two-way tie for me between Claire and Hot Priest. And a large reason why I think I like those characters is because I enjoy the dynamic that they have with Fleabag. The reason why I really like the Hot Priest is because one, I think Andrew Scott did like a really, really great job. He like played that character with like so much endearingness. I don't even know if that's a word, but like that character is so endearing because there is like a genuine openness and a genuine desire to really give people time to talk and for him to just like kind of sit and listen. He's someone who I feel like is just genuinely a good person. Does he have his flaws? Yes, absolutely. He's human. But that's also kind of why you like him is because he is like a real person with real problems and real emotions and real desires and feelings. And then the reason why I love Claire is because I feel like it wasn't even until after I had finished watching the show that upon further reflection, a lot of the scenes that I find really, really funny are Claire scenes. No, 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 Jake, no. Hello. No. Where are you from? I'm, I'm not, this isn't, I'm, I'm, I'm not part of this. I shouldn't have to, I don't want to tell you that. No, sorry, no. The reason why I really like Claire too is because she is someone who tries so hard to keep it together, but underneath, like you could feel the aggravation and irritation like rising and she's just like 0.5 seconds away from losing it. For instance, in that second episode of season two, when after Fleabag like totally breaks the trophy and then Claire's like, oh my God, what are you doing? And she like turns around and opens the box and sees that gold <laughs> statue again. And she's like, you, you can tell she just like wants to lose it, but she's just trying to keep it together. I just find, I just find Claire so funny. And I think that's just a testament to how amazing Sean Clifford is as an actress. And I really hope she gets cast in more things because she is like really, really funny and great. So yeah. Tell the truth. It's horrendous. It's horrendous. It's modern. Don't lie. I'm not. I look like a pencil. Second question from Addie is, what is your favorite episode from both seasons? From season one, my favorite episode is when Claire and Fleabag go to the silent retreat because I just think that situation in and of itself is really, really funny. And putting those two characters and seeing them navigate that situation just played out in a really funny way. Slots! Yes? I remember even when I watched that episode and I realized that this episode was going to be about them in the silent retreat, I remember thinking like, oh my God, this is such a funny, funny like circumstance that Phoebe's written for them. So that was my favorite episode from season one. And then my favorite episode from season two, Ooh, that's so hard, but I'm going to, you know, still stick with what I originally said and say where first half of the episode was really flea bag at Claire's work function and then hijinks ensues. And then kind of the second half of that episode was with Fleabag and the Hot Priest. And they kind of start to emotionally open up with one another. And then that's when we get the Fox story for the first time. So yeah, that was my favorite episode from season two. Addie's last question is, how do you rate the series as a whole after two seasons? Can you rate it out of 10? Gosh, as a whole, I would rate it like 100 out of 10. It's genuinely one of my favorite shows I've ever covered on my channel. It's one of my favorite shows I've watched, period. <sighs> this is like embarrassing to admit, but like as I was editing that final video for the last episode, like I literally started to cry because I realized that I will never get to experience this show for the first time ever again. So much so that after crying, I then went back and started to watch my reaction videos to Fleabag. And I was like, oh my God, this is like so weird. Cause it was like me watching me watch the show. Like it was this like weird self-indulging of some sort. Like, I don't know, it sounds like I'm like masturbating now, which I guess in a way is very apropos to Fleabag, but that's something that I typically don't do, but that's, that's how much I loved the show. And I loved the experience of watching the show because there were just like so many, it, there were so many revelations that I never expected to have as a TV viewer. For me, like probably one of my favorite parts 
about watching the show was that moment when Andrew Scott's character, when the hot priest notices that she breaks the fourth wall. Like, there's been so many shows in the history of TV where we've seen characters break the fourth wall, but I don't think I've ever seen a character notice another character breaking the fourth wall and that actually having some sort of meaning and depth. Like, the narrative device of, of having your main character break the fourth wall, it wasn't just thrown in there because it's like, ooh, like a little gimmick. Like, there was actually like a purpose and a reason as to why she breaks the fourth wall. And that all kind of gets answered beautifully in that final episode of season two when she shakes her head at us because she doesn't need us anymore and then she gives us a little wave as she walks away like oh girl like that was like one of my most favorite experiences as a tv viewer period <laughs> so yeah i keep gushing but i i love i love this show i'm probably going to rewatch this show at some point during this like quarantine <laughs> so yeah jason asks Two questions. If Phoebe Waller-Bridge were to end up revisiting Fleabag when she's 45 or 50, as she stated in some interviews, do you think this would come in the form of a whole new season or something shorter and more contained, like a TV special or a movie? Ooh. I don't see a movie. I don't see a movie for this. I see maybe like a TV special or maybe just like one more season if she were to do that. I, for some reason, I don't see like movie format when it comes to Fleabag. Second question is, do you have any idea which Phoebe Waller-Bridge show you might follow up Fleabag with? Killing Eve? Crashing? And Six Feet of Misery also had a comment here. Now, Steffi girl, you better react to Killing Eve. And Amelia Craig commented underneath and said, maybe put your request to react to Killing Eve in the form of a hashtag question. She'll have to answer it then, as in hashtag Fleabag Q&A. You're gonna react to Killing Eve, right? LOL. Yeah, a lot of you really, really, really want me to watch Killing Eve. My only reservation with Killing Eve is even though I know the first season is written by Phoebe, I'm pretty sure the second season is not. And I'm not quite sure if there's like a diminish in quality because she's not writing season two anymore and if I'm gonna feel that there's a difference in quality with season two and additionally like this might sound like really weird but I'm gonna like miss seeing Phoebe in a Phoebe show where she's like writing I don't know that's like weird but there's a good chance though that Killing Eve might be the next show there's also a good chance that Crashing might be the next show yeah turn on your notifications for this channel so you'll get the next update as to what show I'm going to be covering next. I'm one of those people, like when I get really interested in like an artist, whether it's a TV showrunner or even like a musical artist, like when I get really interested in one particular person, I wanna watch, I wanna listen to everything that they've ever done. Yeah, if you haven't seen that pattern already on my channel, like I've covered quite a number of Ryan Murphy shows. A lot of people have very polarizing thoughts about Ryan Murphy but I think the fact that he can do so many different things, so many different kinds of genres, I find that really intriguing. And I feel like Phoebe's kind of the same way where she could do something like a comedy, a tromedy, trauma comedy, like Fleabag, but then she could also do like a drama-esque sort of thing with Killing Eve. So yeah, I, I really want to get into more of her work. And then I'm potentially thinking of doing Run as well. That's a show that's coming up on HBO that she did with Domhnall Gleeson. I might want to do that too, because the shows that I usually cover like in the spring, early summer, like Handmaid's Tale or Pose, their productions have been suspended as of right now because of the coronavirus. So I have to kind of think of other shows to do in the meantime. So yeah, just turn your notifications on. It's gonna be a Phoebe show for sure, for sure, for sure. All right, well, that's about it for this very long-winded q and I hope you guys made it to the end. If you did, please comment down below and tell me I made it to the end. <laughs> and if you like this video too, please give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and please turn on the notification button down below so you know when a new video for me comes out. I'm gonna be completely honest. I am potentially thinking, because I really do want to get back into doing video essays. That's something that I kind of do as a one-off on my channel, but I really want to start making more video essays on this channel because I think that's something I could really do well in. And I'm thinking of potentially doing a video essay about Fleabag. So if any of you guys have any particular topic ideas that I could cover specifically about Fleabag in a video essay format, please give me suggestions because I feel like Fleabag is a good topic to do a video essay on. So give me your suggestions in the comments 
comment section below. And all right, that's about it for this video. I hope you guys are staying relatively healthy and sane during this crazy, unprecedented time. Stay inside, wash your hands, watch Fleabag again, I don't know, but sending good vibes to all of you and your families and friends because, I don't know, Shit's crazy right now, so yeah. Well, with that being said, as always, everything I said was just my own personal thoughts and all my humble opinion. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Turn your notification bell on. I promise the next show is a Phoebe Waller-Bridge show. So you don't want to miss it. Okay, bye.